We are extremely excited today to bring you this panel discussion with three seasoned experts in artificial intelligence. Now, it's been over three decades since the statistical revolution took the AI world by storm. However, the disappointing progress in conversational agents, natural language understanding and self-driving cars has made it clear that progress has not lived up to the promise of these empirical and data-driven methods. DARPA has suggested that it's time for a third wave in artificial intelligence. Is it time to rethink the dominant paradigm? And what will the future look like? Is it hybrid models, an amalgamation of the previous two waves? And if so, what will these hybrid models look like? Or is the third wave something entirely new? So anyway, I really hope you enjoy the panel discussion today. We've had so much fun preparing for it. Let's kick off with the introductions. First of all, we have Dr. Keith Duggar. He'll be co-moderating our discussion today. Keith has a PhD in chemical engineering and a computer science minor from MIT. At MIT, his research focused on Bayesian analysis of gene expression arrays. Uh, from there, he spent eight years as a Wall Street quantitative trader and software engineer, successfully applying machine learning to high-frequency statistical arbitrage. He's now a principal technology strategist at Microsoft, helping its largest manufacturing customers navigate the complex maze that is data and AI. Now, Keith is a passionate learner and student of logic, probability, and philosophy and he also co-hosts the Machine Learning Street Talk YouTube channel with me. Thank you, Tim. Dr. Tim Scarf will be co-moderating our discussion today. Tim has a first-class degree in computer science and a PhD in machine learning from the University of London. He founded several successful software companies in the 2000s. He was a principal machine learning and software engineer at Microsoft for three years where we met he is now the chief data scientist at BP and CEO of Merge, a software code review platform. He also runs the Machine Learning Street Talk YouTube channel and podcast, where we have interviewed some fascinating guests, such as Francois Chalet and indeed those on this call. Tim is passionate about the nature of intelligence and our evolving conceptions of it. Also on the panel today is J. Mark Bishop. Mark is a professor emeritus of cognitive computing at Goldsmiths, University of London. In 2010, Mark was elected to the chair of the Artificial Intelligence and Simulation of Behaviour, the world's oldest AI society. Mark has been invited to advise on policy at the UN, the EC and the UK government. He's published three academic books, 200 articles and won three million pounds worth of research funding. Mark serves as an associate editor of nine international journals and Mark's research has spanned the practice and theory of artificial intelligence. Mark is interested in the philosophy of mind and in particular differences between human understanding and computational natural language understanding. In particular, Mark thinks that computational theories of mind cannot fully explain human cognition. He thinks that no computational program can ever fully instantiate human intelligence. You need autonomy, embodiment, and a social environment for intelligence to emerge. Mark believes that if a computational process were sufficient to realize consciousness. We would find consciousness everywhere because the same state transitions executed in a computer program that is claimed to be conscious could be mapped onto the bricks of this building, the clothes you are wearing, the very seat you are sitting on. If machine consciousness is possible, then everything is conscious. Even the smallest grain of sand would have an infinitude of conscious experiences. Gadi Singer is Vice President and Director of Cognitive Computing Research at Intel Labs. 
Cognitive computing research drives innovation in machine intelligence and cognition, combining deep learning with deep knowledge structures and symbolic reasoning to materially improve efficiency, explainability, extensibility and reasoning capabilities of AI systems. Gudi joined Intel in 1983 and has since held a variety of senior technical leadership and management positions in chip design, software engineering, CAD development and research. Gudi played a key leadership role in the product line introduction of several new microarchitectures, including the very first Pentium, the first Xeon processors, the first Atom products and even more. He was the Vice President and Engineering Manager of groups including the Enterprise Processors Division, the Software Enabling Group and Intel's Corporate Electronic Design Automation Group. Since 2014, Gadi has participated in driving cross-company AI capabilities in hardware, software and algorithms. Prior to joining Intel Labs, Gadi was Vice President and General Manager of Intel's Artificial Intelligence Platforms Group. Now, um, Gadi received his bachelor's degree in computer engineering from Technion University in Israel, where he also pursued graduate studies with an emphasis on artificial intelligence. Walid Saba is a polymath, an expert in knowledge engineering, ontologies, and conversational AI. Walid lived through the transition from GoFi to empirical AI. One of the arguments he makes emphatically online is that natural language processing is not the same thing as natural language understanding. He is extremely prolific on LinkedIn. We discovered him from reading his racy articles on the pitfalls of empirical AI methods. He thinks that the biggest problem with empirical AI is that most of the information isn't even in the data. It's simply missing from the text. He argues we need to perform analytical reasoning to acquire new knowledge and that no amount of training data will allow deep learning to do that. While it is the co-founder and principal scientist at Ontologic, a natural language processing startup, he was a principal AI scientist at Astound for three years. He was the co-founder and CTO of Clango for six years. He was an associate professor at the American University of Beirut and was associate professor at the University of Windsor for seven years. He obtained his PhD in computer science from Carleton University and his bachelor's and master's in computer science from the University of Windsor. Now let's move on to opening statements. The order will be Gaddy, followed by Mark, and then Walid. Oh, in one word, hybrid, but probably you're expecting a bit more. So deep learning as a technology is extremely valuable and it's improving at a very fast rate. It's very effective in what it does. Because of its value, the answer for me is no winter is expected. There's a lot to be gained. However, there are some fundamental limitations to the underlying statistical correlation-based methods. And because of those deficiencies, there is a need for a new set of AI systems with new capabilities, that will really enable us some things that are new. Systems which are able to understand language and its meaning, not just process form and predict next words. Systems that are inherently mital model that are able to interpret and use on the same semantic plane, visuals and language and knowledge. Systems that integrate common sense, that adapt to new circumstances, new domains, new tasks, and are able to explain themselves as they create new outputs in those new spaces. Systems that are more robust and more customizable due to the use of symbolic entities and abstracted concepts. AI needs to really know the world, its entities, their relations, their history, uh, procedural knowledge, experiential knowledge. And in order to do that, it needs to have an internal model. It needs to have rich knowledge structure. Can it be done by neural network? Maybe some of it, but I don't really believe so. I believe that the next phase is neurosymbolic cognitive AI, which will include explicit, structured, multimodal, multifaceted, well-attributed knowledge bases. Knowledge bases will utilize 
neural network and machine learning to extract information, to create nodes, to create relations, to check the coherence of the overall system and to maintain it. So we should stop debating who is right, the connectionists, the symbolists, the Bayesians. Instead, we need to understand that each of those technologies have some significant strength. And the question is, how do we combine the strength based on the task to create the next generation of AI? And in particular, I believe that neural networks that are well integrated with a knowledge extraction and structuring and with symbolic reasoning are the foundations that can usher in a new era in AI. In 2016, Jeff Hinton famously predicted that by the year 2021, now, in other words, there will be no need to train radiologists because the performance of AI systems would be far superior. Repeatedly in that time span, futurologists such as Elon Musk have predicted level 5 automation is just around the corner. NLP practitioners have said larger and larger models such as GPT-3, 4, 6, 10 will be able to converse and understand language seamlessly. And yet, even a modest and brief interaction with such systems reveals catastrophic failures of them. It's my belief that the same problem, the same issue, is at the root of all these problems. Indeed, it's my belief that computation cannot realise understanding, deep mathematical insight, or consciousness. And hence that there exists a gap, a humanity gap, between that which can be achieved by computational processes alone and that which can be achieved by humans, potentially using computational tools. Three a priori philosophical arguments, John Searle's Chinese Room, the Lucas Penrose argument, and my own minor contribution to the debate, the Dancing with Pixies Reductio, underpin this claim. If any one of these arguments holds, then an unbridgeable ontological gap between computation and mind is firmly established. Well, aside from a diet of too much dodgy sci-fi, I believe a deep confusion between epistemic concerns, for example, how we as humans might seek to establish if a sister or brother had understood our words or was feeling pleasure or pain, etc. And ontological, for example, how we might actually instantiate consciousness, pleasure or pain in a machine, lie at the root of this widespread quasi-religious belief that computation can actually realise cognition. I suggest that any commitment to what the American philosopher John Searle famously termed strong AI, the view that suitably programmed computers can actually understand natural language or genuinely instantiate other mental capabilities of the humans whose behaviour they mimic, is quasi-religious because... In asserting that the mind is independent of the biological material that embodies it, it masks a deeper commitment to a particularly pernicious form of substance dualism, wherein the mind can be uploaded into a suitable computer program and, in principle, live on forever in a future silicon heaven. A concept expertly toyed with by William Gibson in Neuromancer and much earlier by the author Arthur C. Clarke in against the fall of the night and the city and the stars. The underlying confusion between epistemic and ontological concerns is neatly foregrounded in the following. We might model a cow lactating, a plant photosynthesizing, or the physical properties of gold by computational processes. However, such purely computational processes will never make us milk, produce energy from sunlight, nor, sadly, make us rich. Why then should we ever expect computation to physically instantiate cognition, contra model some particular cognitive processes of interest, for example, neural firing rates? In other words, although we can model the behaviour, say, of the planets by the correct application of Kepler's laws, the planets themselves neither compute those laws nor follow them in unfolding their own sublime dances. I truly believe that there's something seriously wrong in artificial intelligence. The, the biggest problem is that we are equating AI with machine learning. Yes, it's true that symbolic AI or GoFi that dominated AI from the mid 50s until the late 80s, early 90s lacked a learning component, which of course made it brittle in new situations. 
through also the symbolic AI phase the knowledge bottleneck problem. So learning was a crucial missing component. In fact, there's ample evidence that most of the knowledge that really matters is not and cannot even be learned. And this can be theoretically proven, even ironically using learnability theory itself. For example, no algorithm can learn. If we give it millions of unsorted data collections paired with sorted data collections, no learning algorithm can uh, discover that we can uh, sort in order n log n. This has to be deductively derived. This cannot be learned from tons or trillions of tons of data. In my opinion, this zealous drive to push learning as the only paradigm that will get us to AGI is not only misleading, but it's very counterproductive. We keep building larger and larger language models in a futile attempt at trying to approximate the infinite number of thoughts we can make in language. In self-driving technology, we completely ignored the frame problem in AI. That is a problem that any autonomous intelligent agent must face, even in domains that are naturally data-centric, like image recognition. The current state of the art cannot successfully be employed in critical situations because they are susceptible to adversarial examples. So to make a long story short, data-driven techniques are no doubt part of the tool set. That's fine. Everything we're doing now is a small fraction of what we will have eventually when we get close to AI. Cognition is a lot more than finding a nice function that covers all the data. I think this should also be done because this is affecting a whole generation in my mind that we lost because they really hang on to the claim that they are doing AI. And I think they are doing very little that has to do with AI. Well, we've had three introductions there from our panelists. And I think a lot of it comes down to this notion of knowledge and if you look at humans compared to other animals, they acquire an increasing amount of knowledge in their lifetime. That really is quite a distinguishing feature. And neural networks, what they can't seem to do is acquire new knowledge through abstract reasoning or deduction. So when any human looks at a banana, we place it into an abstract category. What is that category? Maybe it's ineffable. And are those categories universal? So you show two images to two different workers somewhere in the world and say, what's the essence between these two images? And if they agree on an abstract category, then maybe machine learning could learn what the category is. But there's an infinite number of abstract categories. So Gadi, over to you. How are we going to solve this problem of acquiring this knowledge algorithmically? Data by itself and the processing of data through deep learning has value. There are some problems that it can do, and it can do very well. If you ask people in 2012, how will we be able to do natural language processing, not natural language understanding, by 2018, they would not have guessed what BERT brought, for example, Transformers. But there's a stage of conceptualization, of creating this concept of a banana, which is more than just creating the manifold that can identify banana in every uh, image that it sees it. And that conceptualization is what starts bringing knowledge because knowledge is about an ontology and a structure that moves from the physical, from the specific to concepts. And it does that in a way that there are many instantiation to a concept. So concept is a new level. Knowledge structures and more importantly, knowledge models, things that can operate and create uh, expected outcome, can simulate things, I believe can approximate it. I believe that by understanding that this is not a, just a reflection in one surface, but it's a concept that applies to multiple representation, we can create a computational model of that in a kind of more cognitive AI. I agree with Gadi. Learning from data is useful in many places. It's, it might even prove to be useful in learning concepts. My issue is that concepts, even learning what a banana looks like, is just the beginning of the cognitive journey. Human cognitive capacities go beyond that in, in ways that 
it's not in the data in this sense. My child knew what a banana looked like when they were two or three, uh, and what an apple looks like and what a what an orange looks like. But then they did deductive reasoning. They said, these three objects plus grapes plus plus, they look like they are in the same basket all the time. They're on the same shelf in the store. They're, obviously, they are a category, right? So we, we call them fruits. And then we go up in the hierarchy of reasoning. So knowing what a banana looks like and tastes like and, and feels like is a monumental challenge. But that's the ABC of cognition. That, that's my only issue is that we can't reduce our cognitive capacities to extracting stuff from data. Now, I don't want to go to language because there's nothing now called language understanding. I have no issue with the idea that you can learn something from data. Obviously, you can. And obviously, it's useful. Actually, it makes a whole species called the animal species survive. That's pretty much all they do. So it, it is huge. But if you try to push that to artificial intelligence, the human level AI, I think people are mistaken for many technical reasons. You talked about identifying taxonomies. So the fact that it's not just collecting several modalities into being the same object, but having taxonomies and having hierarchical understanding of things, our ability to build hierarchies associate experiences and attributes gives us a much richer uh, ability to interpret things than just understanding data and labeling it. Yeah, I agree. Totally. I'd like to bring up two points. The first point to come back to Walid is that it isn't completely clear to me that, that we can learn categories from data for the simple reason there's a huge philosophical literature on whether such things as natural kinds exist at all. So I think we can raise a question mark as, as to whether a machine without human input can learn categories, whether there are, in fact, human independent categories possible, whether this notion is even coherent. And secondly, when, if we come back to Gaddy's initial point about recognizing images and recognizing bananas and things, it reminded me of a, of a real life example. One of my, my best man uh, is a guy called Professor Phil Tor. He's professor of computer vision at Oxford University in the UK one of the most highly cited computer scientists of, of his generation. And he spent a lifetime working on, on designing machines to interpret visual stimuli and done it exceedingly well. And I remember many years ago, he was showing me the output of one of his systems when presented with an image of a horse standing by a fence with some scenery in the background. And I, uh, the scenery consisted of some hills with some sheep on there. And Phil said to me, look, I can give this image to my computer system. And it says, that's an image of a horse standing by a fence. Now, if you give that image to a sheep farmer, they might say, ah, oh, there's nice longhorn sheep in that image. That might be the first thing that leap out to them. Or if you give it to a meteorologist, they might say, oh, there's a classic example of a columbio nimbus cloud in the sky. So in other words, my point is that there isn't one canonical reading of an image. It's always context dependent. Now, what Phil said to me then, well, he said, fair enough, I, I take that point. What I, all I can do is I can give this image to 100 humans and say, what is that image of? And if 80 of them say it's a horse standing by a fence and my machine vision system says the same, then I'm content with that. And I think that's a, that's a good engineering response to the question. But I just wanted to unpick the notion that we can't, that the, it seems to me that the meaning of images in general is always contingent on the use to which we as humans are going to put them. And the idea that is somewhat naive to say that we, there's always one canonical meaning of an image, which somehow a, a computer can magically extract from that image. When you look at some of the self-supervised image representation learning algorithms flying around at the moment, they do seem to do exactly that. They learn a universal monolithic vector representation that seems to make sense in a lot of situations. And Facebook are making the argument that because these things are self-supervised, rather than having some pointillistic human annotated label, it's harder to take a shortcut. So the representations that are learned are really good. And there's a really strong argument, I think, that intelligence is generalization. It is the construction of those abstract categories. But as you just said, Mark, those categories are probably not universal. On the self-supervised point that you bring up, I think a bit of that is burying our head in the sand and hoping for the best because that's the, the sheep and the clouds example. 
if you're only providing it with pretty much pictures of farmland and not pictures of just the sky with cumulonimbus clouds or night cityscapes with those kind of clouds, is it even going to be able to find that category, right? Is it even going to be able to learn as part of its vector representation, the bits that did that type of combinatorial comparison on a subset of images and found- I guess, Keith, I was, I was arguing from the stronger that, that we would, let's just assume that you can, even if you could do that, there's still a problem because the meaning of the image is contingent on the use you're going to put to it. Right. And so I'm saying even without, uh, that's another complication. So you first have the combinatorial complexity of categories being subsets of, of the whole. And so you have essentially some subset of the power set, which is just this massively complex space. And then you have the additional complexity of the use or the purpose or the task, as Chalet might put it, that you're applying that, that category to. So I think even when neural networks work well, they're not exactly efficient with their use of parameter space and, and data and everything. I don't see where the, really the hope comes from the idea that just letting it be self-supervised that it's going to discover all these. I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic on that. Strangely enough, I'm, I'm going to defend the deep learning uh, machinery. So to Mark's example of a horse near a fence and the background is sheep and grass and maybe cows and all that. The, the same thing happens in language. People say language is ambiguous because what I read and what you said is different from what someone else read. That's not true, actually, in both cases. We both understand the image and we both understand what was said. That's the understanding. How we interpret things and what our psychological state is and, and what we see and what we care about. So. Deep learning will get to a point that it will identify the horse and the fence and the sheep. I have no doubt. Or something like an advanced deep learning technology. That's not my issue. So the issue is not in image recognition. The issue is somewhere else. The issue is I identified, like God, you said, every object completely. Now what? Can I do reasoning about what I saw? So I don't see the problem. Don't you yep. think there's feedback be between the reasoning system and the recognition system? Because you could theoretically recognize all the elements of the power set of every pixel in the image is something unique, right. but we have a way of pruning it down to subsets that we care about. And I think reasoning yeah. plays a role in that, doesn't it? Right. There's, uh, I, I have no doubt that there's a feedback mechanism between different modules. The pattern recognition module actually in scene analysis, uh, if I enter an office, and I see something brown and long, uh, and it's more likely a cigar than something else. Obviously, there's reasoning that comes in even to image recognition. It's a, it's a feat, I agree. Can I bring in the topic of context? We need to think about two levels of context, a task or domain context and the instantaneous context. The task or domain context is that when there is a task that humans do or machines do around weather or around farming, they look at things in the context of that task. And if it's done by a, somebody from one domain, it will be a different task than another. And this will take care of some of the points that you're making because it will pay attention to other aspects of the image rather than take it as something that is always mapped to the same set of embeddings. The second thing is the instance context. And this is something that I've seen just in the last year where you see AI solutions that are starting to have a feedback loop where they're looking at particular aspects of an image because of the question or because of something that they need to perform. So when you bring context in, both the domain level context as, as well as the inst uh, instance, you can start uh, answering in a much more refined uh, manner. And Keith, it does provide you that feedback loop that's required. Absolutely. Uh, and that's the, uh, that's really the core point I was just trying to underscore, um, that we need that context. The idea that we can get the meaning of an image um, without a context to me is meaningless because there is an infinitude of meanings that we could put onto an image. And to come back to, to Walid, I, I, I know that Walid and I see the world differently when it comes to looking at language and, and ambiguity in language. I, I think kind of after Derrida that, that we create the meaning um, in, in a text. And I'd like to give an example that I think beautifully illustrates this. 
I don't know whether you guys are familiar with the group Nine Inch Nails, but uh, Rasner, um, the singer, created a, a song called Hurt many years ago. And it was about, on the surface, when the Nine Inch Nails performed the song, about Rasner's struggle with heroin addiction. And uh, a very raw and, uh, and dramatic piece of music it is too. Many years later, Resnick was approached by Johnny Cash and the team he was working with for permission to ca Johnny Cash to cover that song. And Resnick was actually quite shocked because he felt he wasn't that keen on Cash's music. He thought Cash might do some horrible pastiche and it would be dreadful. In the end, Cash produced a version of her that is just astonishingly good. And with the same words, and this is where I come back to Wallet, exactly the same words, an utterly different meaning is conveyed. When Cash sings that song, the meaning is him as an old man looking back on his life, and it gives an utterly different take-home point. So the, the syntax of the words is not sufficient to pin down the meaning of the piece. And I know Wallet sees things differently, but I, I, I don't. I think there is always a context uh, and that helps us uh, arrive at the deeper meaning of words. And I think this is, again, beautifully brought forth in any piece of poetry, actually. Of course. So context cannot be denied by someone that works in language understanding. Obviously, context is important. The context here is not just the words themselves. So part of the communication is the singer, the, the, the text, all of that has one meaning, right? The meaning itself is not ambiguous. Our interpretation of something is different. We confuse the two. So we, we think because me and you might look at the same content, the same form, the same structure, right? Differently. We assume that that thing itself is ambiguous. That thing itself is innocent. It's not ambiguous. Take a painting. It's not, it's, a painting is also a structure, not a linguistic structure, but it's a structure. You look at it, I look at it, we see something different in it. The painting itself is innocent. It's not ambiguous. It's saying, this is who I am. That's my content. Same in language. This is my content. How you read it and interpret it is up to you. So when we say, I read it different, Take two books, you read them, I read them, you read them different, I read them different. But we both understood what was said. So let's not confuse understanding with our own interpretation, our own psychological state of mind, our own biases. But the content itself cannot be ambiguous. If content itself is ambiguous, we would never understand each other. Why I interjected, and I apologise for cutting in, but there was a good reason for that, because I think that you're hoisted by your own petard. The particular example of art is famously one which is culturally embedded. The, the, if, when you look at a painting, when an, a, an art critic looks at a painting, they're not just looking at the image, they're looking at the practice, the social norms, the movements that were going around at the time. That is why uh, when the pissoir was exhibited, Duchamp exhi exhibited the, the urinal for the first time and wrote, this is not art on it. He was making a statement. Now, the, the average man or woman in the street would look at that and be shocked, although when the, the pile of bricks was exhibited in the Taint Modern, that's not art, they would say, because anyone can do that. But what they're missing is what makes something art is it's, it's dialogue with the artistic community. It's context, in other words. A piece of art does not exist in a vacuum. Art exists as a dialogue between the artist and a culture which is supporting the art at any one piece of time. So, point, first of all, so that's why I, why I interjected then, because you just felt the example you were giving was one with, with, that was flawed from the get-go. Now, coming to the second point, since Wittgenstein uh, recanted on his earlier work in the Tractatus with the investigations, the famous aphorism that everybody knows who studied any Wittgenstein at all from the investigations is that the meaning of a word lies in its use. It's not a simple absolute definition, it's how it's used in a particular language game. That's what the investigations establishes. And if you disagree with that, then you need to give a decent critique of Wittgenstein. But that's a, that's a fairly robust, and I thought, a pretty Obvious. Uh, actually, actually, Wittgenstein, the later Wittgenstein, has been demolished and is irrelevant since wow. 200 years. So, uh, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm quoting the, the most brilliant philosophers of logic and language. 
But anyway, I, I didn't say that there is no context. Actually, you, you rephrased what I said. I, I, the interpretation of the image, I repeat what I'm saying, the interpretation of the structure. You look at a building, the, the, everything that this building conveys is in it. It's up to you to see what you want to see. It's up to me to see what I want to see. The object itself is not ambiguous. Can, I have a quick question for you, Wallet. I think one of the things that we're really getting to here is some knowledge needs to be acquired analytically or deduced, right? An example of this, as you said, is the average time complexity of sorting or maybe the abstract essence of a banana. But if I was going to play devil's advocate with you now, imagine if a deep learning person was in this conversation and they might say to you, well, what if that stuff was in the data? You're arguing that it's not in the data, but it kind of is in the data. You know, Christian Sergedi at Google, he's doing this. He, he's actually building these tree representations of, of formulas and analytical reasoning and mathematics. And he thinks that it's actually possible to create new mathematics through this kind of interpolation. So, you know, a, a deep question is, do you think there are statistical regularities to this kind of analytical type of data that you're talking about? Right. There is in some domains where it, it, I'm allowed to approximate and I'm allowed to make a decision with a certain probability associated with it, but not in factual knowledge. So there are two types of things we learn. We learn things that, okay, it seems like I, I am good at recognizing objects. I might sometimes, in those uh, skills, I'm allowed to approximate and I'm allowed to have, to make a decision with some certainty. But most of our knowledge, and I would argue, if you separate what we know from what animals know, almost everything else unique to humans is not learnable. This is, a, I, I, I know it sounds like an extreme statement, but I would like people to reflect on that. Almost everything, take everything that animals can do out image recognition, sound recognition, just do a compliment, right? What remains and what makes us unique are things that are not learned from observation, from data, from experience. So to, to say that this paradigm will achieve AGI, you are saying it will achieve the ultimate intelligent rat at best. Everything that is uniquely human is done by deduction, by reasoning, by analytics. It cannot be learned because here is why. All these facts are facts. By definition, they're either true and we know them or they are still to be discovered. Okay. So we cannot learn them differently. If we learn them, the five of us, because we live a different life, we have different experiences, different observations, we might learn them differently. That's not allowed. So by contradiction, these things are not learned. There is reasoning and deduction. Take the transitivity property. If this object is larger than this object, and this is larger than this, then this is larger than this. This is probably something that we learned and acquired by evolution years ago, because a two-year-old knows if the ball didn't fit in this briefcase, it will not fit in a smaller one. That's transitivity. That, that is not learned. You cannot learn this. So, yes, you can learn a lot from data. I go back to my initial point. But the best you will achieve is animal-like intelligence. When you learn through school about whether it's math or history or concepts about democracy and others, uh, you have some innate abilities to create structures and to tie them. But there's a lot of learning that is happening through those, uh, those years. And uh, machines, if they are equipped with the ability not only to look at surface data, because you keep uh, equating a thing, a learning with deep learning, which is looking at surface data. But if machines are capable of constructing the same type of structures and connections and hierarchies and taxonomies, you can introduce them to those and they can adopt them. And if you are able to convey to a machine a hierarchy, and relations and an operating model, then that machine can uh, acquire that and use it. I yes. didn't say we don't learn. Obviously, I learned uh, that I can I can sort uh, 
with n log n. We call both types of learning learning. That, that's the confusion in language. I, I agree. Language. I didn't learn what a buffalo is by deduction. I just saw a buffalo. Let, let, there are two types of knowledge acquisition. We have to recognize this. The, the, the folk meaning of learning, or I know how to ride a bicycle, or I know a fact, confuses the matter. These are two different types of knowledge. And let me emphasize the difference. I saw a buffalo, and now I know what a buffalo looks like. We use the word I know, so we associate that with knowledge. But I knew that I can sort an n log n not by seeing two lists, by deduction. This is not from data. I knew what a buffalo looks like by just looking, sensory input. I learned a lot of uh, calculus and I, a lot of logic, but I didn't learn it by observation, by sensing, by data. No, I learned it by instruction, by deduction, by analytic reasoning. So, yeah, yeah so we learn. We learn. You need analytic reasoning and deduction. But I want to just make a point on models. I believe that what we get from the world at a certain point is a very narrow signal. The way we do a lot of our thinking and understanding is based on internal models. We have a model of a banana, we have a model of animals. And when we get a, a signal, our intellect operate with those models and the signal from the outside just tells us which model we should bring uh, up for that. And by doing that, we can have a very rich interaction and reasoning, even if the signal is relatively narrow, because we find the right models that we already have to uh, complete all the missing, uh, missing aspects. Learning is about communicating and helping creating additional models or strengthening models. And then we can operate even on narrow signal based on the models that we already have for similar things. Yeah, central to my critiques of AI is the notion that I don't believe, uh, for arguments I give in Dancing with the Pixie Traductor, that computation can bring forth consciousness. But I think that's that this statement has profound implica implications to do with understanding, because it seems to me, and not just me, for example, Stefan Harnard in his critique of Luciano Floridi's philosophy of information called Lunch Uncertain, uh, Stefan foregrounds the importance of the phenomenal component of understanding a proposition. So I can flesh this out with an example from my own school days. I remember I had to study calculus um, for my, in my elementary school for my sins. And then but after a little while, getting quite good at the application of the formula such that I could correctly apply the formula in appropriate circumstances and get 10 out of 10 for my math homework. Sometime later, after I mastered that skill, <clears throat> the penny dropped and I understood what calculus was. And that went along with a bodily sensation of understanding. And I, I contend, and Harnad, I think, agrees with this, um, that, that in all understanding, there's a phenomenal component. We know and we've grasped the essence of a proposition. And so it seems to me that why I think one of the reasons why, if there is a critique that machines can't instantiate phenomenal states, is that's important for machine understanding, as well as the other component, which I believe phenomenology is critical when we're trying to get machines to act of their own volition, to have their own teleology, if you like. Uh, without a phenomenal state where one thing matters to the machine more than another, you can't really have genuine autonomy because otherwise what the machine does is always hard engineered from the outside by people like Gaddy. It's not from the machine's own point of view because for the machine without phenomenology, nothing matters more than anything else. I'd like to pivot this back really to future directions and, and really what we're just trying to do is improve the cognitive capabilities of current systems. And I think we probably all agree that they do need to be hybrid. They need to incorporate some ability to do symbolic reasoning. Um, now, some people favor a modular system where you have, let's say, layers of differentiable neural networks with, with layers of symbolic reasoning over that, and then they connect together. Others favor one unified thing that's not only differentiable, but can somehow represent um, symbolic reasoning. And I'm curious to get all your takes on which of those approaches you think might be the most fruitful. And if it's the merged thing, like say 
a differentiable neural computer or a neural Turing machine, it seems like any time they get closer to symbolic capabilities, they, they start to lose the optimizability. They start to lose differentiability. It becomes harder and harder to actually search that, that program space, if you will. Um, so if I could get comments on that and we'll turn over to, um, to Gaddy first. It's, uh, if you'd like from the software world, it's object oriented. It's a modular system, I believe, that has modules that have particular strength that are built on particular technologies that work very well together. Because uh, as you mentioned, each technology, if you look at neural networks, they have significant strength in that they understand the whole space and they can they can manipulate the manifolds without having to, to uh, kind of keep dark areas in that. So having modules that are built on some techniques um, is very effective. However, we need to be able to very well integrate those as part of one large systems. For example, if you have a neural network that needs to extract information in a particular way, they, you can have a module that retrieves the information, processes it, maybe even does some reasoning before it provides an input back within the embedding space, within the language of the neural network. So you can integrate modules very tightly to create one smooth operation, but I do believe that the future is in creating a hybrid system that is built on very well integrated modules, which have strength in one particular approach or another. I subscribe to that wholeheartedly. Hybrid has to be defined very well because people work on hybrid systems for years. They try to integrate variables in, in sub-symbolic systems. But these systems didn't go anywhere. I, I think the idea of modularity is, it seems to be, even neuroscientists have, have, have at least pr provided evidence that the mind is modular. Uh, Jerry Fowler's modularity of mind, Marvin Minsky's society of mind comes to mind. Things like we have a module, for example, that's good at interpreting colors. We have a module that's good at interpreting sounds or haptic uh, feeling like the touch. We have a module that counts. It looks at a collection of objects and it says we have six things here. So we have specialized modules. None of them is hybrid. The system as a whole is hybrid because it uses everything we've ever discovered. And that makes sense because everything that we know mm -hmm. is true ca can be used somewhere, right? And that's the biggest challenge in my mind for AI. I know a technology that I've been excited by recently, it's not new anymore, but uh, it, it's probably over, well over a decade old now, and that's Monte Carlo Tree Search and, and the way that we can use that in exciting ways with neural networks to do some things that are akin to planning and game playing and what have you. I find that very exciting. So that, that's something I, m my team have been working with for a, for a few years now and doing some kind of fun things. Uh, but the heart of all my pronouncements is just a caution about what, what these things are achieving, achieving and what we can achieve. Um, at the end of the day, I don't see any reason to suppose that AI systems are still going to get things wrong, and badly wrong, potentially. Mm. The question for the uh, legislating bodies, and I don't know whether everyone's aware, but the EU are now shortly going to do an act uh, um, law akin to the GDPR on the application of AI. I was just reading a critique by Floridi about that today. Um, and we need, just need to be aware that AI will get things wrong occasionally. The big question is, would it get things uh, uh, badly wrong less often than a human? If, if it does do better than a human in most of the time, then perhaps that's good enough. What you were saying about the Monte Carlo tree search is fascinating, uh, uh, Mark, because I, I guess we're talking about what the future is and neurosymbolic methods. And a lot of people don't realize that GPT-3, there's a discrete search over the top of it. AlphaGo, there's a discrete Alpha search go. over the top mm. of it. These, su these so-called sub-symbolic sub methods, they are, they're still connectionism. They're just ways of encoding discrete information into a neural network. I think it's fair to say that the paradigm in connectionism is that we should have a monolithic approach to artificial intelligence and people like gary marcus they say that we should have a discrete world model and we should 
be doing reasoning and planning and acting over this discrete world knowledge. And I think all of us agree, you know, symbolists and connectionists, we agree that common sense is like the dark matter of the universe. It, it is the bulk of intelligence. Mm. That's what we need. But there's an impedance mismatch between connectionism and symbolic systems. Should we fix the architecture or should we create a kind of emergent system that right. that comes right. later? The, the key word is emergent. I, I compare it to what happened in physics. You have the quantum level, the data level, and you have the high level, the reasoning level at a different point. And how do we connect them? How does a high level reasoning emerge from data, to, from sensory input? We do pattern recognition. We do sensory data analysis, but that's not enough. There's another level of reasoning that, and we have to connect the two. So I think modular AI, specialized modules, and how this, uh, this emergence will happen and how do these modules talk to each other? That's the challenge in AI. We're still in alchemy in AI. Well, if one looks at the uh, neural network structures pe people come up with, you certainly get that idea. But I yeah. guess um, to try and steal man, the, uh, the connectionist folks, for example, Mark, maybe it takes an ecosystem of individuals and, and autonomy and, and whatnot to create intelligence. But I think we would probably all agree that a human mind, even if it was off by itself on a deserted island, is still an intelligent entity. Like at that point, once it's developed up there in its brain, and there are those who say, look, up there in the brain, we can cut open the brain and look at it. And it is just a bunch of neurons. And even though artificial neural networks are abstractions on that, they throw away a lot of the dynamic detail and the, the continuity. They capture some essence of what a neuron does, like collect inputs, integrate them together and, and fire an, an, an output. And so what we often like to ask is, what's missing? Okay, if you take artificial neural networks, what is missing? What's stopping me from creating a huge artificial ne neural network that can operate enough of what the brain does in order for it to conduct reasoning in these intelligent activities. What's missing? What do we need to add to the artificial neuron or to deep neural networks to give them that, that capability? Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's a number of ways that I'd like to uh, approach this. The first, uh, uh, the first um, approach is to say that when you get a physical system, and you build a computational model of it, you do so at a certain level of abstraction. So a neuroscientist who's uh, interested in, in, in neural firing frequencies will build a model that accurately models, as accurately as they can, models how a neuron will fire over a particular, uh, given particular stimuli to that, that neuron. Another one might be looking at computation uh, the cyto uh, skeleton of of the neuron that might involve, as people like Hammeroff suggest, quantum processes. So the first question is, you've got to think, what is it you're going to model, and is that thing a computable thing? And that's an interesting question uh, in its own right, because as as David Deutsch highlighted in 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 the eighties, and this has been a, and Lorentz also famously picked up on this with uh, the, the, with computational simulations of chaotic systems. It can be very difficult to model computationally certain types of dy uh, of complex dynamic system and some ill-behaved complex dynamic systems. And a number of neuroscientists have, have pointed to the brain as existing in some of these particularly ill-behaved complex dynamical systems. So it may be that we just can't compute them. So that's one thing. A second thing is, even if you have a system that, that, that these aren't ill-behaved uh, chaotic systems, you have a problem. This comes from the work of Bogs, uh, Boghosian in 2019, who looked at when we want to model real value numbers, we've got a problem because any representation of real value numbers is non-uniformly distributed along the real axis. And that can in, that can also bring another degree of failure when you're modeling complex real dynamic systems. So I think everyone thinks, oh, it's easy. We'll get a brain, we'll build a model of it. The two fundamental problems, are you've got to set your level of analysis, what's interesting to you, without replicating the brain in toto, in which case you've got all the causal powers of a brain because you've built, and people like Craig Ventner who are building artificial neurons out of real stuff, you're building a brain. Without doing that, you're always concerned with some things that you want to model. And then secondly, there are real 
uh, questions about whether uh, computation can replicate the causal power of the brain. And I've highlighted a few in that description. So hopefully that gives you some insight on my thinking on these issues, Keith. Well, so first, uh, you're asking a question of, since neurons are creating the brain and all its capabilities and deep learning is a emulation of neurons at some level, why can't you do it all? It's like asking in a computer, everything is made of transistors. So everything is the same, isn't it? If you just know how to do logic or just know how to build memories or just know how to do any of those, each of those blocks can do everything. And the answer is that you put the building blocks in very different ways. And deep learning is a very specific way to put together a, a, some kind of emulation or analogy mm. of a neuron. So even if we use emulation of neurons, it's not just deep learning. But in terms of the missing capabilities, we need to uh, understand what are the key tasks. And some of the key tasks has to do with processing and uh, some data and transferring to a different plane, which deep learning does very well. Some of it is keeping knowledge in a structure that is associative, that is hierarchical, that is ontology-based. So we need to think about all the constructs and the skills that the brain needs in order to have very strong cognitive abilities. The big question, I don't know the answer, which is, if you look at the brain, it's all neurons. I mean, yeah, we know we do reasoning, but in the end, it's all firing. So what, why is the deep learning paradigm not consistent with, so what is missing? A lot is missing. We don't know, for example, where we know we store information. We all agree. We have memories, we have long-term, short-term. Do we know how we store information in our brain? What is missing is a lot more than we like to admit, right? The human brain probably is pretty well understood as a physical, biological organ. But the mind, where do we store information? What's the nature of our memory? How, how, do, we, how do we keep an image of a banana in the mind? So we have a lot we don't know. What's missing? is more than we like to admit let's be humble let's not let's not say uh, agi is going to be here five years from now let's be very humble amazing well um gentlemen this has been an absolutely fascinating panel discussion all of you are going to finish now with your closing statement our debate so far feels like it's 60 years old connectionism symbolism Turing machine functional if we want to cross over into the world of cognitive science. But of course, cognitive science has moved on hugely in those 60 years. And um, one of the things that's been exciting me a lot in the intervening period has been the development of the so-called embodied and inactive and embedded traditions of cognitive science. So if we take this uh, as something interesting, to come back to Key's point, it's not the individual neurons that 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 bring forth the mind. It's not even a brain, because neurons exist in, in a culture, a culture which is the brain, the human brain. But it's not even the brain on its own, because the brain exists emb embodied in a physical body. But it's not just the human body on existing on its own. The human body exists in an environment like Keith's putative desert island. But it's not just an environment on its own. A human body exists in a human society. And I think all of these things contribute to our cognizing about the world and in particular language and social aspects can actually shape i believe how we phenomenally see the world sure. mark i i get your point in embodiment and i i believe uh, i i fell in love with george lakoff's uh, uh metaphors that all all of our meanings and understanding are related to our physical experiences the real physical uh, uh uh, manifestations that we we but he, here's the thing if you take a chimpanzee right and this chimpanzee lives with humans all the time like any of my kids he's always with us as much as my kid and so they're experiencing the same environment same sounds the same images the same music they're experiencing what my kids are experiencing and we know that biologically their brain and our brain are almost 99% identical. This chimpanzee will never reason, will never do abstraction, will never speak, will never communicate. So I agree with you, the environment is important. Nobody is dismissing that. 
But it's not the sole unique thing about our mind. The human mind is not just a function of rain and sun and pain and touching stones and all that. Chimpanzees can live with us for a million years, and they have, and they will never do what we do. The mind is more than just the environment. But I think if you'd heard what I said, I think for me it's the neurons in our brain, the brain in our body, the body in our environment, and our human bodies in a human culture. All these things bring forth the cognitive processes for the species. That's my position anyway. If we would have this debate in June of uh, 2011, we would not have been able to predict the tremendous progress that was made by deep learning. In the coming 10 years, we will have significantly more cognitive machines. Not consciousness, not AGI, but machines that have capabilities of understanding across modalities, of synthesizing, of creating, uh, creating results that are truly meaningful. And in order to do that, it's based on having a much better model of the world within the machine. It's not an input-output function. Intelligent beings and intelligent machines need to have a model of the world that is very detailed, that have a lot of capabilities, that have knowledge that is structured in layers, in abstractions, in hierarchy, and then to interpret input within that very rich context, within that very rich modeling. And we will see machines with cognitive abilities that will be able to understand language, will be able to generate uh, new ideas based on concepts, and will be able to interact with humans and be also uh, interpretable and uh, explaining themselves. Yeah, so I like Gadi's uh, future prediction. I can predict some future, by the way. 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 50 years from now, the best sorting algorithm will be order n log n. There are things we predict and we approximate, and but there's true facts in the universe that we have no option of refuting. It's not all relative and ambiguous, and let's see what the data tells me. If that was the case, we would not have survived 10 years, let alone millions of years. There's a system underneath everything, and I think AI cannot move forward. And I'm sorry, Gadi, but I, I don't see this progress in AI. I mean, it's like UFOs. You hear about them, you never see them. I, I, I am aware of the state of the art and language understanding. That's what I do every day. The, uh, we don't have a system that understands what a three-year-old understands without even thinking about what they're saying. And the extremism that's happening now that uh, we're confusing learning with intelligence. Learning is one part of what we do. Our cognitive capacities are much more complex until we understand the real problem, how big it is. Like autonomous driving that ignored the frame problem. It's all going to collapse, no matter how many papers we write, no matter how many news articles claim big things. The reality is we haven't made real progress, real progress in discovering anything new in AI. I would like to have to come back to Gaddy that AI to me is like a man's progress in AI is analogous to man's progress at climbing trees as a, as a way to get to the moon. Uh, in other words, what we're doing on AI, we're making incremental progress, but it, it doesn't seem to me that it's going to ever get us to building true AGI in the same way that climbing a tree will never get a human onto the moon. Okay. Well, thank you all so much uh, for your time in this panel. I think we, I think we all really enjoyed it. We've had a, we've had a blast. Tim, I'll turn it over to you to uh, wrap up. Folks, this has been nope. an incredible panel discussion. Thank you so much, and. For folks listening at home, reach out to us. This is the kind of thing that we can do more regularly. So if you enjoyed this conversation, let us know, and that will give us the motivation to do something similar again. Mm -hmm.